So you might find yourself in a situation where either you don't have a controller like the push, or uh, if you do, it may not be with you. You might be making music on the fly, or you might be using something a bit like this, the MPK Mini, which is a really nice little controller. But how do you make this controller change more than just the notes? Because this can actually be more than just a mini piano or something to trigger the actual notes. We can use some of these dials, providing you have them on your controller, or these pads so we can assign certain parameters, which instantly makes this much more a valuable tool when we're making music. I've loaded up the wavetable, and I want to assign certain parameters to this glorious little keyboard. So firstly, we'll look into making a controller like this far more integrated into Ableton Live by adjusting some of the parameters and bringing some of these dials and pads to life and linking them with some of the parameters in Ableton Live. And after that, we'll look at even without something like this, we can actually change how our computer keyboard or a generic keyboard can also have certain parameters assigned. We do this by using some modes you might have seen up here. So we have MIDI and key. So we'll look at MIDI first. The important difference is that MIDI is gonna be about these kinds of parameters that work on dials or different kinds of flows of how the parameter can be changed. Whereas key is very much geared towards keys being on and off. So toggling on and off, because obviously we can't turn a key. It can only do sort of very simple, straightforward on off or one motion uh, parameters. When we click on MIDI, you'll notice that everything dramatically turns blue. I'm sure lots of you have done it by accident and panicked, uh, but if you toggle it off, it disappears again. But when I open the browser library here, when I click MIDI, it changes, and we can see that it's now changed into something called MIDI mappings. This is gonna be really useful because as we start to assign different parameters, it's going to give us a list of what we've done. So it's always good to be able to reference what has been assigned. It's important once you're in MIDI mode and everything's turned blue, is that you're very conscious of where you're clicking because each click is very meaningful to Ableton Live and you need to be careful to click it back off again once you are done assigning. So the first thing I'm gonna do, I want to change this. So I'm just gonna solo this. I've got some chords in here on my wavetable. Nice. But what I wanna do is I want to now assign the frequency to one of these dials here. So as I'm playing it, I can actually start to turn these and change them throughout the tune, creating some more interesting movement in the actual piece. To do this, I click on MIDI. I click on the parameter I want to assign once. So it's now got the brackets around and all I need to do is twist the dial that I want it to correspond to. And you'll notice as soon as I did that, can you see that there's a fraction next to the dial or frequency? It says one slash 70. You don't need to worry too much about this. This is basically how the controller is communicating with Ableton Live. So according to these two, Ableton Live sees this dial as CC70. That's just what it calls it. Now that I'm happy with doing that, I'm going to go out of MIDI mode and then I'm gonna test it. So I'm gonna trigger this again. And sure enough, as I start to turn my dial, it's affecting the frequency nicely. So now I have a really nice playable situation. And if I double check it in MIDI mode, we can see that it has listed it as CC70, as we remember. And what it does, what path it goes through is the wavetable. So it's affecting the wavetable device. What in it is it affecting? Filter one frequency. And we also have a minimum and maximum setting here. So we have the minimum, how low that particular dial can go and how high it can go. It's important to note this because you might not want this dial to be able to go all the way one way or all the way another. An example of this would be, if I come out of this MIDI mode now, look what happened when I turned this down. I accidentally, and obviously we all get excited when we're playing something live, I could accidentally completely lose it by taking all the frequencies out and dropping it down to 20 hertz, which was the minimum on the actual parameter uh, limitation. So I wanna safeguard it and make sure that in my excitement, I can't take it further than, let's say there. We can still hear it, can't we? It's got the effect, but it hasn't disappeared quite as much as there. So making note of that, that's around 209 or 210 Hertz, okay? Let's go back into MIDI mode. And here I can either type in manually or drag it, clicking upwards vertically but I'm just gonna type in 210, enter, and I'm gonna let it go up to the maximum because I'm happy with that. And now when I untoggle, hopefully now, as far as I turn it, I can go all the way and being really like 
reckless with it, it will not go past that nice safeguarded point. And obviously I can do that for the other way. If I very specifically have something in mind, I make sure that the max is lower so it can't go higher than a certain point. Maybe put that up. So again, I'm just safeguarding myself here and can make sure I don't go further. Oh, I've accidentally changed it to a really unhelpful frequency there. So I've accidentally put this higher than the other, which we'll look into techniques of that in a moment, but I'm just gonna get a bit higher there. It's a bit of trial and error, play it again. And great, I can't go further that way and I can't go further that way. So it stays in a nice safe zone. So I just made a mistake as well on here and I just wanna get rid of it. I can quickly go into MIDI mappings and just delete it off the list. So I can go back on myself and untether something. So if you make a mistake, it's really easy. Go into your MIDI mappings and just delete that row. So I'm gonna try again. And what I'm doing here is I'm assigning the next dial because I want to control the oscillator position locator here. So again, click on it once, wiggle this dial over here to show Ableton Live, that's what I want it to correspond to. It's nicely there on the MIDI mappings. Again, I can control the parameters. Notice that the parameters will correspond to whatever these parameters are. So where this was kilohertz and hertz, this is percentage because that's how that particular parameter is measured. So come out of that and now, I can mess around with both. Quite cool, I can come up with like nice combinations of the frequency and the... So this can also be a nice way of just discovering the sound design as well and like just having a much more usable way of doing this. If I don't have access to something like the push or even if I do have access to the push and I just want to make it a bit simpler. It's a really nice way of doing that. So not to be limited, we can actually assign multiple things to one dial. So let's say for example, I want the resonance to be affected here. I can go back into the MIDI and I now want the resonance to also be on that same first dial. So when the frequency changes, the resonance does too. And really helpfully in the list, it's put it next to it. Even though I did it after this wave position one, it's put it nicely next to its counterpart there. So both of these have the same control, 70, but they're doing two different things. And when I play it back, it's a bit drastic, isn't it? As I go up on the frequency, that resonance has jumped far too high. How do we control that? Of course, we go in here and I make sure the resonance cannot go that high. And I also want to make sure it can't really go too low either. I'm just going to get it down to a sort of healthy point there. And now when I increase one, it increases the frequency as we go up, but again, it's limited. So it can't go too crazy. On the flip side of this, I might want one to move differently while the other moves in a certain way. So when the dial goes upwards or to the right, I might want the resonance to go down as the frequency goes up. The way of doing this is simply basically changing the polarity of these minimum and max. So here, as I put this at 61%, as it was up higher, I'm gonna put this down to be the 19% one, or 16, whatever I decide, and this one's now going up to be at the max, which means that that dial is now gonna behave differently because minimum and maximum is basically uh, anti-clockwise and clockwise on the, on the actual dial. So as I come out of this, as I turn it, look at that, so the resonance is going up as the frequency goes down. So already some fun ways of messing around with our sounds and a bit more of a performance function to this. In the same way as dials that we've been using, I can now assign certain uh, buttons to correspond to these pads. I can do it uh, with actual certain buttons within the parameters, as well as I can do it with actual triggering of clips or samples or whatever. So first example, we'll stick to the wavetable. I want this sub here to be controlled by this button here. 
And the same as wiggling the dial, all I had to do was press it once, and I can already see this fraction here, which is obviously corresponding to note E1, which is what Ableton Live has decided this is called. So when I take MIDI mode off, I can toggle that sub on and off. Very, very nice. So I can set everything up for it and have it ready. Maybe I want it minus two or minus one, whichever, transpose it, etc. But it means that as I play, I can turn it on and off. Maybe open the tone out a little bit. Gain down a little bit. I might even want to use this transpose function. And that's separate. So it's nice to be able to have the ability to just toggle that on and off. So when we turn on MIDI mode, anything, anything that lights up blue is indicating that it can be assigned to something. We have to remember that anything that has a sliding scale needs to be attached to something that has a sliding scale, like a dial or a dial that moves upwards or downwards. But anything that's static on off, so for example, turning that beat on or off, I could click on this and say that this button here now controls the activation, so whether that channel's on or off. Um, and I can quickly go straight on while I'm in MIDI mode and click on the next thing. So maybe I want this clip to be controlled by this here. And I can keep doing this, just move through. I can have this here and decide that this one controls this. So if you're quick about it, you can just go through in MIDI mode, click, assign, click, assign, click, assign, and quickly just generate this um, whole host of, a whole roster of different controls. So as I play here, I can control this. And then what was my assignment? Turning this off, beats off. And then I can bring it back in simply. Then if I want to move it to the next one, remember I'd assigned that. I'll go back into MIDI mode, correspond this to this. Gorgeous. And then I can toggle nicely between these. Off again. Sweet. So really quick way of assigning some really helpful uh, shortcuts and just making this much more playable and fun. But again, as I mentioned, if you don't have access to one of these little controllers, which I do recommend, and you can get them for quite reasonable prices online, you can also set up your keyboard, limited as it is, because obviously most keyboards only have keys. So as I mentioned, it needs to be something that can be toggled on or off. But also, as you noticed, we can do that with clips. So if you're sitting on a train or just in a situation where you don't have access to any of these, you can still turn your computer keyboard into a really helpful device to actually trigger through clips. So just as we use the MIDI mode, which turned everything blue, gave us our MIDI mapping here, we can also assign some keys in a similar way. I'm just going to get uh, rid of some of these because I'm going to assign some new bits. As I come out of MIDI section, I simply press key. And instead of being blue, it's now orange, but it works in the same way. But obviously, we can only work with things that can be toggled on and off. Let's say, for example, we want to go back into these particular clips and use the actual buttons on our computer keyboard, if we're on the move, to trigger the clips. Same situation. I click once on what I want to assign once on the actual button that I'm assigning it to, clicking here, pressing two, clicking here, pressing three, clicking here, pressing four. The one thing I want you to be mindful of when you're assigning some of these keys is that, as we know, the keyboard itself already has shortcuts within it. So again, if you have the keyboard highlighted here, it's basically acknowledging that the computer keyboard is acting as a piano keyboard. So if you start to use some of these, the, the buttons here that are, so for example, if I use this on the wavetable, if I record enable here, and as I move up here, these buttons already have an assignment. So if you decide that you are assigning other things to this, it's going to clash and become complicated. So just be mindful of that and try and avoid using the ones if you know that in this particular project, you might be using this keyboard to actually just act as a, as a, a piano keyboard. Now that I've assigned the keys, we can see that it has mapped the key mappings here. I can see that key one, two, three, and four, they all correspond to slot one, slot two, slot three in the house beat section. 
There's no need to have minimums and maximums because this is a toggle on off situation. That's all a button can do. When I come out of this, sure enough, we will be able to trigger the first. And I'm just moving through using these. Nice. So it's a really quick way of turning your computer keyboard into a really useful functional triggering device.